Good evening, everybody. Wow, a Jewish crowd that listens. I don't know, maybe it's the rain. Anyway, good evening and welcome to Central Synagogue. Thank you all for joining us to hear Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt speak on anti-Semitism, a threat to Jews, democracy, and global stability. I'm Shawnee Silverberg, and I'm president of Central Synagogue. In addition to our own members, I am especially proud to welcome the leadership and supporter of UJA Federation of New York, including a board chair, president, I'm not sure, Linda Morrells, what your, what your current title is, um, who are co-sponsors of tonight's event. I am here this evening with my feet firmly planted in both of these wonderful New York Jewish institutions. Central, which has provided my family with a Jewish home, and UJA, where my husband John Shapiro is a past president and the lay leader of UJA's initiative to combat anti-Semitism. Central Synagogue and UJA Federation of New York have long been partners in fighting anti-Semitism and supporting Jewish life at home and abroad. Many of you in this audience supported UJA's annual campaign and the Israel Emergency Fund that was launched in the immediate aftermath of the October 7th attacks. Central members have generously supported UJA's Israel Emergency Fund both directly and also indirectly through Central Synagogue Israel Relief Fund, which has also provided direct grants to a number of Israeli organizations. Before we hear from Ambassador Lipstadt, I would like to invite Hindi Pupko, Senior Vice President of Community Strategy and External Strategy at UJA, to talk briefly about their work since October 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Silverberg. It's a distinct honor for me to be in this congregation under the leadership of your incredible rabbi, Rabbi Angela Buchdahl. In so many ways, as you said, this congregation and this community has been on the leading edge of responding to this crisis. I actually remember sitting right there about two weeks after October 7th when this community, together with us, hosted what I think was the first big New York event with hostage families. And you continue to lead in so many ways, and we are so grateful for your partnership. And the truth is, the past few months have really been a testament to the strength and resiliency of the New York Jewish community. The UJA Federation Emergency Campaign raised over $185 million. <laughs> to date, there is $73 million of our collective philanthropy at work in Israel. But perhaps most profound, beyond the number itself, is that on 10-7, on Shabbat, the UJA Board and Executive Committee convened on that day, the first time in our history, and allocated $10 million before one additional dollar was raised. And so many of you in this room and outside of this room behaved in the way that I think we wanted to model for our children. You were with us on October 10th with over 30,000 Jews at the UN. You were with us on the 30-day mark, Central Park West, another 30, 40,000 Jews, and you marched with us to Washington with hundreds of thousands of other Jews. And in so many ways, on almost every level, you find ways to stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel. And while we continue to respond to the crisis in Israel, we know that we have our own crisis here at home. I was born in the 80s to uh, parents who are Jewish professionals. And I remember very vividly in the 90s, there was a debate around should we dismantle the ADL, right? There was actually a conversation is, if anti-Semitism is over, let's double down on Jewish continuity. Why do we need these defense organizations? And here we are. We know the statistics, we know the stories. 400% increase in anti-Jewish hate. And the truth is what's different about this moment is we don't just know the stories of college students or Paris, we now have our own stories. I will never forget on the first Friday night after 10-7, I was walking home 
on West End Avenue and 88th Street, I'm sure many of you can picture that corner, with my husband and three young children. And we passed a group of three teenagers. And one of them turned around and shouted at us, should we kidnap the boy or the girl? And thankfully, my kids were in their own world and didn't hear it. But who could have imagined that in 2023, we would be having conversations with our children that our grandparents and great-grandparents had with their children? And in the face of this unprecedented hate, we are also seeing unprecedented levels of engagement and organizing. Jews standing up for themselves at work, on campus, on the streets, demanding that we feel safe. Feel safe wearing a kippah or an IDF sweatshirt on campus. Feeling psychologically safe to identify as who we are wherever we find ourselves. And UJA is right there with you. Right after 10-7, we allocated four and a half million dollars in new security guards for underprotected Jewish institutions. We're educating our elected officials, taking them to Israel, arranging encounters with hostage families, fighting for Jewish students with meeting with leaders of universities, heads of HR to make sure that Jews who want an affinity group at work get an affinity group at work, fighting for our rights in every sector and partnering with all of you. But as alongside all of this work, I want to end with a reminder that I'm sure Ambassador Lipstadt will remind us all of tonight. She said, we must not allow anti-Semitism to define us, and we must never cede control of our identity to our oppressors. Ambassador, you honor us with your presence tonight, and I know we all sleep a little bit better knowing that we have you in the State Department. Thank you all for being with us tonight. And now back to you, Dr. Silverberg. I have one bone to pick with Hindi. She stole my remarks. <laughs> Literally, she stole my remarks. <laughs> Not the content, although some of that as well, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you, Hindi, for the remarks and for my remarks. And now we'll turn to the main event. We are delighted to welcome Ambassador Lipstadt to discuss a topic that is front of mind for all of us. For over 40 years, Ambassador Lipstadt engaged in groundbreaking scholarship on anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. Indeed, she devoted literally years of her life to proving in an English court that the Holocaust had actually happened. In 2022, she was the logical choice to be named Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Antisemitism, an ambassadorial level position. She stepped into that role at a time when there was already an uptick in anti-Semitic incidents globally, in the United States, and in our city and state. And that was before October 7th. Since that horrible day, anti-Semitic incidents have, been, have increased by about 400% and have included clear echoes of Holocaust denial in the delegitimization or outright denial of Hamas attacks and behaviors on 10-7. We are truly blessed to have a person of Ambassador Lipstadt's intellectual heft and experience in her role today. And we are so pleased to have her at Central Synagogue, where she will share her thoughts and then engage in conversation with Rabbi Buchdahl. We hope to have some time for questions, which some of you submitted when you registered. Please welcome Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt, along with our very own Senior Rabbi Angela Buchdahl. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We haven't lost Rabbi Buchdahl. She's going to sit there while I say a few words to sort of frame tonight. First of all, it's a pleasure being here. My first gift ever to Federation, to any Federation, was to New York Federation. Uh, we learned that at home. And I've been coming to Central for many years. I've known Angela, if I might, uh, for 18 years. We figured that out because we first met when Rosie was a little, little baby and in Aspen. And we hiked the mountains and the trails together uh, while Jacob sat in the, in the uh, hotel room overcome with altitude sickness. So we had a chance to bond, and we have remained friends. I saw her as a star and a gift for all of us then and even more so now. So it's a pleasure being here. Um, I thought I would start just with framing some of my remarks before Rabbi Buchdahl and I engage in conversation. And for how do we think about anti-Semitism other than we don't want to think about it or we think about it and it's very bad? I think a number of things that I'd like to lay out as a framework. First and foremost, anti-Semitism is a prejudice like other prejudices. It operates in the same way. A Jew does something wrong, ah, that's how they all are. A Jew does something right, oh, that's one of the good ones. You can replace Jew there with a person of color, you can place with any, any uh, minority group. And in that sense, uh, anti-Semitism is no different from other um, prejudices. But it also has certain unique elements. And it's those unique elements that I want to focus on. First of all, and some of you have heard me, I've written about this and some of you have read it uh, or heard me speak about it, there's the punching down, punching up element. Uh, take racism. Racism looks upon the person of color and says, that person is not my equal. That person shouldn't live in my neighborhood. That person, kids, shouldn't go to my kid's school. They're all right if they know their place. And similar things, you know, yuck, you know. Uh, and it's, there's similar attitudes towards Jews. Jews are dirty. During COVID, we saw it. It's particularly uh, um, directed at Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews, and Jews who can, uh, you know, we don't want them or, and that kind of thing, but not only. But there's an added element to anti-Semitism, and that's the punching up syndrome. Or uh, The Jew is seen as part of the conspiracy myth, which is the cornerstone of anti-Semitism. And note I say conspiracy myth and not conspiracy theory, because theories can be proven, and this is a myth. This is a fan fantasy of gigantic proportions. But part of the fantasy is the Jew is, uh, has something to do with money, one element. The Jew is either richer than us, more financially powerful than us. The Jew is cleverer. But clever not is a good thing. Clever is smart, but also clever, conniving, controlling. I don't know if it's a hard C or whatever. But the, and the Jews know how small in number, but know how to manipulate things. And the Jew is out for their own good. It doesn't matter what happens to everyone else. They are only interested in their own good. And therefore, they're a threat to me, the non-Jew. So I have to punch up and protect myself by any means necessary. So that makes the conspiracy idea and the idea that Jews are engaged in a conspiracy against everyone else does not appear in, in virtually any of the other prejudice. So that's, I think I want, I will keep that in mind, a prejudice with its unique elements. The other point, and just to make this, to frame this and before I enter into conversation with Rabbi Buchdahl, is that I think it is time for us to start thinking about anti-Semitism differently. Yes, first and foremost, it's a multi-layered or multi-leveled approach. First level, as a threat to Jews and to the welfare of Jews and the Jewish community. And were it solely that, it would be a worthwhile thing to fight. Because a government's job is to be like a parent, in loco parentis, to protect its citizens. 
That's what a parent's primary job is, to protect their kids. How you define that protection and what parameters you give it is an individual thing. But the government's job is to protect its citizens, and particularly, and this goes particularly for uh, democracies, its most vulnerable citizens. That's why we have child welfare laws. That's why we have laws about uh, special protections for senior citizens or for the vulnerable. That's why we have uh, protections on water, or on medicines, to make sure people are not harmed. So that alone, the fact that it's a threat to Jews, would make it a valid thing to fight. But it is more than just that. I put that, obviously, in quotation marks. It is also a threat to democracy. Because anybody who believes, who has bought into the anti-Semitic myth, the conspiracy myth, who thinks Jews control uh, the elections, the media, the banks, etc., has essentially given up on democracy. But it's more than just that. Autocrats, bad actors, or as, we, as they're called in the United States government intelligence community, malign influencers, use anti-Semitism, here I will use a very technical term, as a kochlafel, a cooking spoon, to stir, uh, those of you who have Yiddish backgrounds recognize that, to stir up the pot. Particularly those from autocratic countries, autocratic backgrounds, if I can make a democracy look like a failed state, or if I can make the citizens of that democracy feel it is becoming a failed state. It can't protect me. It can't see to my welfare. Then I've achieved a uh, goal for myself. And those bad actors can be other countries. They can be NGOs. They can be individuals, whomever it might be. But we've certainly seen that uh, a very broadly. We've seen a surge in anti-Semitism on Chinese-controlled, PRC-controlled, government-controlled um, social media platforms. And you have to ask, there's a, a Hebrew saying, the rabbis say, ma'inyan shmita etzal har sinai. Har sinai, there's the story of the giving of the Torah, and the next law that's mentioned is the sabbatical year. So it's, it's, a, it's a party for them to figure out what's the connection between these two things. So what's the connection between the PRC and engaging in anti-Semitism? If any of you, I'm sure many of you have traveled to China, if you know Chinese nationals, you know there's always uh, an affinity for Jews. You're an ancient civilization, we're an ancient civilization. You believe in filial piety, we believe in filial piety. You believe material success is a blessing, we don't use the term blessing, but we believe material success is something to be achieved. So it's been a, a very, and, and China was just having very strong relations with, uh, building strong relations with Israel. So what's going on here? We don't know for a fact. The Chinese haven't come and told us. But one can assume that it's a way of saying, okay, you supported uh, Israel, we're going to support Hamas. Uh, you, but why the anti-Semitism? Well, you claim you are such a great democracy. Are you really such a great democracy if this is the case? Uh, this is speculation. I'm not saying this is fact. But when you see a 180 like that, you've got to ask what's going on. The, the point, however, to remember is these malign influencers, whatever country or group they may be, can't create a fire that isn't there. So I don't want you to think, oh, the anti-Semitism is only coming from outside. They see a fire smoldering, they can add fuel to the fire. So we, and, and that leads to national instability. Because if you think you're a failed state, if you think the government can't protect you, if you think terrible things are going on, then it's an ins you feel unstable. And that is something I, since October 7th, I've been in Italy, I've been in Germany, I've been in England. Uh, I, I just was uh, back in Germany. I was just in the United Kingdom, just, uh, just came back yesterday. Um, all the government leaders are thinking in this regard. They are beginning to see, and if they aren't, when I share this with them, they, they understand it, they get it. 
And when I've talked to our people in our own intelligence community, I say to them, am, am I nuts? And they say no, and what you're saying makes a lot of sense, or they've already seen it that way. So in our thinking of this fight against anti-Semitism, we're not fighting just, and I put again just in quotation marks, for our security, but we're fighting, I think, for the future of our country and for all democracies. And with that, Rabbi Buchdahl. Thank you, Ambassador Lipstadt, for that. Now I not only have to worry about the Jewish people, but democracy in our country, security, but actually, I've been worrying about that already. So um, first of all, it is such an honor to have you here. I know it's not the first time, but it really is an honor to have you here as the first time as our ambassador um, fighting, combating anti-Semitism, um, to be with our extended New York um, Jewish community in partnership with UJA, who has been such an incredible partner um, always, but we really have felt that particularly post-October 7th in this work that we've been able to do together. And I want to particularly thank Hindi Pupko, who's been um, a brilliant leader for the Jewish community. Um, you are one of our real heroes. Um, you've been in this fight for so long, um, and yet it feels like we're in a different moment. And um, I'm gonna start with kind of just an easy question. <laughs> These are all easy questions you guys um, brought, to, brought to the table, but they're really hard. Um, you know, for a long time, I've been trying to make a distinction between um, anti-Semitism and being able to be critical of the state of Israel and even what we might call anti-Zionism, that there should be a way that we can distinguish between that. Um, and yet, post-October 7th, I think the line has been much harder to draw between what is anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, especially when there were just attacks from day one. Um, you deserve this, a sort of dehumanization and demonization of Israel immediately, um, a kind of double standard when you look at the fact that they're being called to genocide by South Africa um, in the international courts. And so can you help us understand now how does anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism line up? Can we make a line between them anymore? Um, and if we can, what are the lines that help us distinguish between valid critique of a country and a government and what is just anti-Semitism? You know, there were many people, including many Jews, many of whom worshiped in these pews, who in the 1920s and 30s and even 40s didn't believe there should be a Jewish state who worried about what a Jewish state, how a Jewish state would reflect on their own loyalties to this country. Would the citizens of the Jewish state be called Jews? Well, would, how would that impact them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that changed. Certainly it changed after the Shoah for many people. Um, and then it changed even more uh, after the establishment of the State of Israel. So anti-Zionism, while historically there were Jews and there were certainly non-Jews who didn't think it was valid, I think today we're in a very different period. Um, now, one can, uh, in terms of criticism of, the Isra of Israel's policies, you know, it almost seems humiliating to have to say that or annoying to have to say criticism of Israeli policy is not anti-Semitism. Would anybody need to say criticism of American policy is not anti-Americanism? Of course not. But, but the People who, so to speak, are, to speak shortly, who are on the other side often say, oh, I'm just being criticized because I'm, I'm being called an anti-Semite because I'm critical of Israel. That's rarely the case. Um, if criticism of Israeli policy were anti-Semitism, the hundreds of thousands of Israelis who marched over a period of seven months every single Saturday night in opposition to judicial reform would be anti-Semites, and of course, that is utterly ludicrous. But what we find today, often, is the people who are anti-Israel say, oh, I'm only anti-Zionist. First of all, they're against the idea of the existence of the only Jewish state, where over half, the, or half, the world's Jewish population live. Where are they supposed to go? And when they tell you, oh, we're looking for a uh, a binational kind of state, that doesn't work in Belgium, 
much less in the Middle East. You know, it's not working so well in, in, in Belgium. Go to Brussels you'll, and then go to the other parts. Um, and certainly hasn't worked in Lebanon. So it's, it's a fanciful kind of thing. And often we find the people who say, I'm just anti-Zionist, first of all, are against the whole idea of a Jewish state. And when you dig not very deep into their criticisms, you find their classic anti-Semitism. But that's a long answer. The short answer right, recently, I've been asked a lot, that a lot by the press, and I say to them, you know, I think you're asking the wrong person. Uh, look, ask the person who torched the synagogue in Montreal or the synagogue in Philadelphia or the team, I guess, in Westchester, uh, the, bas the girls' basketball team that was so hostile to the kids from a Jewish school or the uh, a, a Hamas terrorist who called his parents to boast he just killed 10 Yahudim or, or the people who marched at Sydney, in front of the Sydney, the iconic Sydney uh, Opera House on October 9th, before Israel had even figured out what had happened to it, chanting, I, I, I hate, F the Jews, or gas the Jews. Now they claim they didn't say gas the Jews, they said, where are the Jews? Let me tell you, that's just as ominous as gas the Jews. And this was on October 9th. And there are dozens of these kind of examples, and you know them. Those people have demonstrated that for them, there is no difference between anti-Israel sentiments, anti-Zionist sentiments, and anti-Semitism. They've crossed the line. So I'm not sure whether I have to worry that much about the parsing, though I do. I think the reason why I ask that is because there's a big question about like what the boundaries of like, you know red lines within the Jewish community and I think that this has been very challenging as I think that there are people who sincerely have um, real uh, criticism of what's you know maybe a military policy or um, and yet I think that it's been very hard to figure out where where do we draw the lines within our own Jewish community let's let's put aside those who are outside our community but even within our own Jewish community those who are anti-Zionist but certainly there are difference of sentiments you know even if you talk so you said you had hostage families here I have met with dozens of hostage families and former hostages in my offices at the State Department Department and other places in Israel, and just recently at the Munich Security Conference, where there was a very large delegation. I spent quite a bit of time with them. Some of them want a ceasefire yesterday. Some of them want this fight, this fight to go on until Hamas is eradicated. There's a difference of opinion. They live in a democracy. They can have a difference of opinion. And I think we'll have differences of opinion in the Jewish community. Uh, but I think when you question the right for there to be a Jewish state. When you say things like Zionism is racism, that is the last vestige of the USSR. The USSR disappeared a couple of decades ago, but that's a vestige, 1974-75. The, the Soviet Union, even in the beginning of the 20s, went on an anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Zionist rampage because it said, you don't need a Jewish state, you're, you know, we, don't, we are against nationalism, and other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what did it do? It closed down the synagogues, it closed down Jewish institutions, you saw right there the connection. So I think, you know, criticism is one thing, um, but too often it crosses the line. So this anti-Semitism, which sometimes comes in the form of being um, anti-Zionist, but sometimes also just straight up anti-Semitism, we see that often as we call it anti-Semitism, the left, I don't know if this is clear, if it's left or right, and we often have said what's on the right is sort of more traditional white supremacy that we recognize and, you know, Jews will not replace us. Are there different strategies for how you approach fighting anti-Semitism that's coming from these two sort of very diff seemingly different places, but are the tropes, you know, uh, re resonant in both places, and how do you approach and fight? You know, I think it's more efficacious than thinking right to left, to think like a horseshoe. And the two ends of the horseshoe, you know, and they can be magnetized. Um, in this case, 
meet right there. And what's interesting is their, the stereotypes in which they engage, their anti-Semitic stereotypes are the same. Money, power, you know, if you're on the left, Jews are, all capital, uh, Jews are capitalists. If you're on the right, Jews are communists and revolutionaries, you know, and, and back and forth. Now, it's true, you're right, that for many decades, um, our main focus was anti-Semitism from the far right. And that's, that's a valid thing. Pittsburgh, Poway, San Diego, so many places, that's what we've seen. But there's also anti-Semitism that comes from the far left, and sometimes the not so far left. Um, it's not of the same, well, by and large, it hasn't been of the same violent nature, but it does very great violence to the Jewish enterprise and the Jewish uh, dignity, you know. And But one of the things that I, I refuse, the, one of the arguments, and there are very few that I refuse to get into because that's by my nature, you know, but is when people say to me, which is worse? And I was asked that in my Senate hearings and my confirmations hearings before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I told the Senate, the, the committee, that I'm an equal opportunity fighter of anti-Semitism. I don't wear, no care where it comes from. If it hadn't been the August hearing halls of the uh, hearing room of the Senate, one of the hearing rooms of the Senate, I might have channeled Shalom Aleichem. And I can imagine Shalom Aleichem saying, would I rather die of dysentery in Odessa or uh, cholera in Kiev? Neither, you know? I think, I think it's, it's a fool's errand to to try to say, they're both bad, they're both dangerous in different ways. I pick neither. So um, I've often thought that the key to fighting anti-Semitism, or one of them, is education. We have to, it's the hard work of, you know, building relationships, teaching people, teaching about the Holocaust. This has been something that has been your line of work for decades. Um, and I think one of the things that has been frightening post-October 7th is to see that some of this hatred, and it really has been hatred, some of it, um, and vitriol and prejudice has come from some of the most hallowed, educated halls of our country, from the most elite universities, from educated students, from professors who have PhDs. So um, it puts a little bit of a lie to the you know, as long as you're educated, you're going to, you're not going to, you're not going to fall into these traps. So can you talk a little bit about, first of all, what are we supposed to be educating to help people um, understand anti-Semitism better? And what's the connection between education and anti-Semitism? You know, we're people who loves education. People were literate. I think it was Abba Eben who used to talk about being able to read a Hebrew book upside down because when he first, um, no, it wasn't Abba Eben, it was someone else, but because when they learned, there weren't enough books to go around. So you just stood around the table. If you were on the side of the teacher's table, you, you learned how to read it upside down. We're people who loves literacy. Um, and so on some level, we thought education would solve everything. But as, as I told you a few days ago, when we were preparing, when we talked to, in preparation for this, um, I'm reminded of the fact that during the Shoah, during the Holocaust, you know, there was, there was a sh there were many people who were murdered in gas chambers, but there were people who also were murdered by the mobile killing units. Uh, we know the name Babiyar, Ponari, other, other places like that. And there were four mobile killing units called Einsatzgruppen, and uh, of the four leaders of these mobile killing units, three of them had PhDs, one had two PhDs in economics and law, and one was a minister. I said, you know, I don't know if I can say this here, but I will and you'll tell me afterwards. You can be a PhD and an SOB at the same time, you know? Um, and, and we've certainly seen that in recent days. Now, I'm not against education. That's what I do for a living. You know, now I'm a diplomat, but I'm, I still, it's, it's, it's not that dissimilar. It's in my blood, absolutely. Um, and, but we can't think of education as a magic bullet. Heidegger, Voltaire, go back further. Voltaire, one of the geniuses of the 17th century, an ardent anti-Semite. 
Heidegger, one of the great thinkers, an ardent anti-Semite, and so many others. Those are just two names I'm mentioning. So uh, anti-Semitism can come from anywhere. I think it makes people stupid when they engage in it because it is such a stupid, uh, fanciful, and dangerous enterprise. But education is not a magic bullet. Now, having said that, um, I believe in Holocaust education. Some of my students are here. Um, and I certainly wouldn't have devoted my life to it. But to think that that's going to automatically solve anti-Semitism, it just doesn't work. In fact, for the anti-Semite, oh, they hated them too. You know, there must have been something wrong with them. Um, I think we do have to, you talked about the work of building relationships. I think that is exceptionally important. I think educating, educating about hatred, educating about who we are and what we are, teaching about living Jews and not just you know, the Jews who died. Well, I, I was privileged to have a private meeting with the Pope on October 10th. I was in Rome on October 7th, and we had uh, hoped to get a meeting scheduled, and were told that it was not going to be possible. And then on October 9th, we were called and said the Pope will see Ambassador Lipstadt tomorrow or the next day. And one of the things I talked to the Pope about, I talked to him about um, the hostages. Uh, then we knew children, had, many had been taken. I talked about, particularly about the children hostages and asked him to speak out, which he ultimately did, as did his Secretary of State, not just because of mine, me, I'm sure many other people asked him as well. Um, but I also talked about educating, how necessary it is for the Catholic Church and the Vatican to ensure that the clerics, priests, nuns, teachers, who are not just to educate them about the Shoah, about how Jews died, but how Jews lived, and about Jews as a living organism. And it was a very, it was a, it was a promising conversation. Mm. So, in terms of what's happening on our college campuses and how we might educate differently, in terms of strategy, I think there are different ways that that we've been hearing different Jews pushing for what they think would be would make our students safer on campuses. And I wonder if you think the strategy should be more free speech and a more um, even application of free speech across, or if, you should be, if there should be more regulation, more um, safe spaces, um, for, where more regulation of, of, of speech and just include Jews in the DEI work and kind of throw them in with that. Like, where do you think, or I don't know if you feel like there's a better strategy for how we should, uh, treat our educational institutions and the anti-Semitism within it. It's, you know, my, my remit is overseas, but I've, I've, in England I was talking to students, in Germany I talked to students, in France I talked to students, and the, the college campus, the university campus has been a difficult place in, in Europe for quite a while, and now it's, it's become more difficult here as well. Um, I don't believe in safe places. You have a niece who's about to go off to the University of Chicago, and I very much uh, applaud the provost of the University of Chicago who wrote a letter a couple of years ago. If you're looking for a safe place, safe spaces, don't come here. We're going to come here to challenge. Of course, he wasn't saying it's okay to be assaulted, but physically and mentally and emotionally, we're going to challenge you. Um, you know, I, I think that what I would say to universities and I don't, the free speech is not the issue. It's for the universities. It's for everyone. I mean, if I talk to other governments and they say to me, you know, I, I was approached recently by the Australian government, because, the Attorney General of Australia, and um, they're about to appoint someone similar to my job, and he wanted to talk to me about it. And I said, this is an issue you have to take seriously. That's the first thing I would say to universities. Too many universities all over the world, including the United States, haven't taken this issue seriously because they see the students who need special help, special protection, are students who may be first generation college, students who who come from maybe lower income families or whatever. Jewish students look to them white. They aren't all white, but they look to them white. They look to them privileged. And you know what? Even if they all were white and they're all privileged, Dara Horn makes this, in her one, makes this point in her wonderful article um, on Harvard. I know you went to Yale and you're a Yale family, so I can, I can trash Harvard here safely. Okay. <laughs> um, 
but uh, that we wouldn't gay the people the people who originally openly um, acknowledged being gay, et cetera, were mainly white men. Many in the gay community, not all, because that's again a, a fallacy, are wealthy, and we would say, oh, they don't deserve our protection because they're white and they're they're well healed. Only the poor, and the, you know, it's it's ridiculous. But universities have not seen Jews as uh, potential victims. In fact, I know a, a very fine university where there was an actual act of anti-Semitism, and the student went to the uh, vice provost who was in charge of this, and the vice provost listened very seriously and took it very seriously and picked up her phone and said, you stay here. I'm calling the chaplain of the university and the Office of Religious Life to deal with this. And the student said, this is not a matter of religious life. This is a matter of prejudice, and this is what you should be dealing with. So there's been a failure to see that as part of the panoply of um, DEI uh, issues. But it gets worse than that. In many places, and it's, it's, I don't think it's his official university policy, but for many students and even professors on campus, Jews are not, not only not in need of protection, but they're part of the problem. Jews are powerful, Jew, fall back into those anti-Semitic stereotypes, and you see it all there. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But at the very least, I would ask universities to take this issue seriously, and if there's a problem, don't, you know, if there's, a, if, if Jews, if, if you, you want to stop a Jewish event, which some universities have done, because we can't provide protection, well, get more protection. You know, it, it don't shut down the victims. That's right. Um, you and I, in some ways, have been in this conversation for many years now. I mean, we've been in conversation, fortunately, for decades, but about anti-Semitism, you were good enough to give me a galley of your book when I was going to do a sermon on anti-Semitism now more than five years ago. Um, and I remember that in the past, you've always been very cautious not to overblow anything. And, and you told a story that I've heard you tell about you know, an incident that I think happened at Emory, which is where you used to teach. and. Um, where an anti-Semitic incident happened, and you said, everyone made a big story about this horrible anti-Semitic incident. She said, but you know what happened the next day is students put like blue in their windows to show support. And you said, and unfortunately, we hear the story of the student and the horrible incident, but you don't actually hear the story of how the vast majority of students showed to show support for that student. And I love that story because I too don't want to overblow or overplay and say things are worse than they are. And I think it's, it's easier for us to focus on the, the horrible stories. But I have to say that post October 7th, I don't see those blue signs in the windows coming out for Jews, the proverbial support. Um, if you, yes, there have been multiple organizations that are um, in favor of, um, of Palestinians. And, I, I want our Jewish students to be pro-Palestinian also, right? It's a very difficult line to say. I would never want to say we're anti-Palestinian rights and freedoms and liberties. Um, but there have been many, many organizations that say we're on this side. And, and on virtually every campus, there has been not a single group that is not Jewish that has stood with Jewish students. No, and so I'm not seeing the blue signs right now. And I'm wondering, what has changed? Why does it feel different? Why did Jews, Jewish students feel so alone? When I think actually in the past when anti-Semitic incidents happened, we, ha we found our allies and our friends. You're very right. And it's probably that that's most disturbing. Um, Look, think about the gender-based violence, we call it GBV, which is a very antiseptic term for rape, mutilation, particularly of women, and horrific m mutilation. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen, I think, what is it, the 43 or 46 minute film, which shows some of that. I was up on Capitol Hill about two weeks ago in a private closed door meeting with a number of members of, of Congress and uh, officials from the Israeli police who showed us evident, not public pictures. And you saw picture after picture after picture, different places. It was, I've never seen anything like that. Horrific, horrific. Um, and yet what happened afterwards? 
silence from the human rights, silence from the feminist communities, silence from those very organizations which I'm sure you've been a member of, I've been a member of, we've been supported of, supporter of. And then came the cries for the evidence, show us the evidence. And if I remember correctly, when the Me Too movement emerged, the, the thing was believe the women. Why would a woman make up a story like that? Why would someone make up a story? I mean, you see the evidence, you see. And what was really disturbing is the pictures we saw came from multiple of pl different places and were so similar in nature. So that this, you know, there's the, um, I forget if it was Brown Miller, or a, a feminist scholar said, there's rape that's a consequence of war. The soldiers, you know, do horrific things. Um, and there's rape that's a policy of war. And this very much strikes one as a policy. We saw it before, we saw it with the Yassidi women. Um, but the difference here that struck me, and, and Ambassador Michelle Taylor, our ambassador to Geneva and I, had an op-ed and we put it in The Guardian. Why, and, and I told that to some newspaper, well, why The Guardian? And I said, because, in fact, I was asked that by an editor at the Wall Street Journal. And I said, because if I'd published it in the Wall Street Journal, I would have been writing for the choir. In The Guardian, it's a, left, a very left liberal pub, uh, publication. I wanted their readers to see it. And the two of us wrote a number of things. First of all, that denial of the Holocaust took decades to even gain any roots. And this took days. And more importantly, when you look at the response of the human rights community and the feminist, so many of the feminist organizations, all of whom spoke out with alacrity, with speed, after the horrific nature of what was done to the Yassidi women, horrific nature to the Yassidi women, or Boko Haram when the Nigerian girls were, were and some are still captured, but when they bring back our girls, or the Iranian women when they took off their head scarfs, scarfs. Some were murdered. Many were just, just were just were were treated horrifically by Iranian officials. They didn't say, "Show us the evidence. Show us the proof." When, and here they didn't do that. And so we asked, "What's the difference?" You know, Manish Tana, this this incident from all from these other incidents. And the only answer we could come up with is that these victims were perceived to be Jew, all Jews. They weren't all Jews. There were Druze, there were Muslims, there were foreign visitors, people who had come for the rave, people who had workers, workers, but they were perceived to be Jews and therefore they were worthy victims. And that is anti-Semitism. So I think people still don't fully understand anti-Semitism. So one of the things that has been pushed is adopting the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Um, I know I think 40 countries have adopted this and yet there are um, institutions and and I know America has actually adopted this but is we but, uh, the State Department and the, uh, has embraced it and it is in, and that's acknowledged and mentioned in the very introduction to the White House's national plan to fight anti-semitism that's good to hear and yet we know that there are many places for where it is controversial. Can you tell us why would it be controversial? And, um, and do you think it should be something that we are pushing for people to adopt uh, yeah, and our we, institutions to adopt? Um, it is a working definition. A working definition means non-legally binding, but something to guide officials, whether heads of schools, whether law enforcement, to help them understand what is anti-Semitism. It is new, if you ask the critics, they wouldn't mention this, but it is nuanced. It gives a number of examples, and it introduces those examples, and it says these may or may not constitute anti-Semitism, depending on their context, a word that's 
been, you know, sort of, yes, uh, after what happened on Capitol Hill. But um, so we have found it very nuanced. Uh, Secretary Biden, who, to whom I report directly, uh, embraced it, enthusiastically embraced it, and we have found it a useful tool. We also are struck by the fact that over 40 countries have adopted it, hundreds of soccer teams, of uh, industries, uh, Lufthansa, when they had an incident, realized that they had an incident with a, a number of, uh, a whole large group of uh, Hasidic Jews were ejected from a flight, the plane landed, they weren't ejected midair. Um, uh and, uh, and they weren't a group. There were some amongst them who hadn't followed Lufthansa's rules then of masks, wearing masks, but they all were ejected. It happened in the back of the plane. People in the front of the plane also were not allowed to continue traveling. And Lufthansa realized it had a problem. I met with the CEO, came to Washington, met with me. We worked together. I saw him just now in Munich. Um, and they've instituted, they adopted the IRA definition as a guideline for them to help their employees understand understand uh, what it might be. Uh, there's been, I think, somewhat of a canard that it shuts down free speech or things like that. It's a working definition. It's a guideline. Um, and I think the fight over it may be a fight over other things that, you know, but I, we, we, we find it a useful, a useful uh, tool. And um, if you, and I urge you to go to, go to whitehouse.gov put in the word anti-Semitism and download the 60-page or 70-page national strategy for fighting anti-Semitism. I was privileged to have a hand in helping craft that. We've had presidents over the years, both sides of the aisle, who have condemned anti-Semitism and unequivocally condemned it. But we've never had a national strategy for fighting it. And over 24 national agencies the usual suspects, Department of Education, FBI, counterterrorism, uh, gathered and, uh, to figure out what they could do. Justice, the Department of Justice, of course. But there was also agriculture was there. And, and Can you tell us the agriculture, agriculture well, for fighting anti-Semitism? Agriculture, agriculture runs 4-H clubs in rural areas where there are virtually no Jews. How do they educate people about Jews so they shouldn't fall prey to anti-Semitism? FEMA. FEMA? In certain places, including I think here during Sandy, uh, FEMA showed up with, with truckloads of food in Orthodox neighborhoods, none of which was kosher. Um, welfare. Well, the, uh, this, uh, the, they looked at their lists of approved snacks, you know, that you could get if you get assistance. And most of them were, were not hechsher, didn't have a hechsher, didn't have a, a you know, a kosher. So they, they began to reevaluate that. So it wasn't just fighting anti-Semitism, but how does it e make it easier to live as a Jew? So, and that was, and, and the, the strategy, if you look at it, you'll see that there are dates for completion. Uh, the State Department, we had to respond what we're doing, et cetera. And, and it's moving. Will it solve the problem? Of course not. And one of the things it stresses is the need for a whole of society approach. Government can't do this alone. But at least now we have a blueprint, we have a plan. And by the way, our plan is being used as a model in other countries for their, for their plans as well. Grateful to hear that and for your work on that. Um, you mentioned about the IRA um, uh, you know, definition of anti-Semitism, that it actually came from um, lived experiences. Yes. Can you tell us how a little yeah, bit about the, that? Because when, I think that helps us understand right. why that definition is so critically important. Uh, I forget how many years ago it was, but uh, at least a decade, uh, when this was beginning to be put together. And one of the examples come from uh, uh, surveys that were done of European Jews, particularly European Jews. How do they encounter anti-Semitism? So many of the examples which relate to Israel, because that's how they were first encountering anti-Semitism. Um, so it comes from people's lived experience. But you know, no definition is static. Definitions change, definitions adapt. You know, if you were to define um, uh, marital abuse uh, of, uh, 
40 years ago, 50 years ago, would be very different from what you define, or even child abuse. You know, it's my kid, I can do with them. No, you can't, but you know. Um, but I think this has been a very, I'm sad, this, the country of controversy over makes me sad because first of all, it's, it's wasted energy, I think, in, in great respects. And it's a internal fight and the, the, much of the controversy, most of the controversy does nothing to fight anti-Semitism, but it's, it's, it becomes, uh, it, it's a useful document if applied correctly. Now there are people, some people who haven't applied it, you know, or have used it as law and stuff like, and things like that. But, you know, knives are sometimes used badly but no one is saying outlaw knives. You know, I, I don't know if the analogy works, but things, a good thing can be used incorrectly, and um, this has been a useful document for many governments and many uh, institutions uh, to help them understand what is anti-Semitism. That's helpful. So I think, especially post-October 7th, the Jewish community has been trying to figure out what is the best strategy and what can we do? And I think many of us want to do something immediately. Um, you know, we've seen everything from, you know, 30 second Super Bowl ads to, um, you know, withholding donations from institutions that are, you know, not living up to the values that we care about um, to, you know, doxing trucks. Okay, so we've, there've been lots of different strategies, certainly in the kind of the immediate aftermath of how do we fight anti-Semitism. What would you say are what you think are the most effective strategies? And then maybe specifically, what do you think each one of us in this room, what is one or two things we could each individually do? Because I think part of what happens when you feel completely um, impotent to make any impact is you, you can start to despair when you feel like there's nothing that you can do, even each of us in a small way. So kind of big strategy do you think that works as well as like individuals? You know, I wish I had an easy answer. If I had an easy answer, I would have printed it up, stayed home and sent it out to all of you, et cetera. First of all, as I think you and I agree, this is not an easy fix problem. This is not something which can be changed overnight. Um, and I think, in fact, what we've seen, especially with young people, students, et cetera, some of whom, some of whom I think take what they hear very seriously, but some of whom, you know, when they're asked from the river to the sea, I, I, I saw one student say, I think from the Bosphorus to the Black Sea. Uh, the student failed both history and geography, you know? Um, and someone else was chanting from the mountains to the sea, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a cheap shot on some level, I acknowledge that, you know. Et chata'ayani maskir hayom, my sins do I acknowledge today. Um, but but it's, not, it's not gonna be a short kind of thing. Um, it's gonna call for rebuilding relationships. It's going to call, first of all, for this war to be over. Um, and whenever that happens, let's hope, hope it's sooner rather than later. Um, but I think, yes, what you can do, first of all, educate yourselves about what is anti-Semitism. Uh, Justice Potter Stewart's famous, most famous line to ever come out of the Supreme Court about pornography is, I can't define it, but... I know when I say it. There you go. Um, Many of us have that, you know, we used to talk about gay dar, you know. Many of us have that anti-Semitic dar. You know, we, we know it, we can smell it, we can hear it, we can feel it, et cetera. Um, but that's not enough. You've really got to educate yourself to understand when the person is just being adult and when the person is being an anti-Semitic adult. You know, and to figure out, and it's hard sometimes to know what to say. We all know the perfect thing that we should have said when we encounter an anti-Semitic argument. The problem is we know it at two o'clock in the morning when we sit up in bed, bolt upright in bed and say, that's what I should have said, you know, at that moment. Uh, I'm reminded I have a friend who uh, went to uh, a school here at Columbia and she, her graduate school um, made study groups, you know, and right from the first day. And the study group she was in had non-Jews in it, mainly from outside of metropolitan areas. And most of them had never worked closely with a Jew. She came from New York, her family very hospitable and uh, a modern Orthodox family, and they invite these other 
people in the study group over. And when do you invite? You invite for Friday night, you invite for the Purim party, for the Hanukkah party. And they felt very close and very appreciative of the welcome they had found in that home. And fast forward to right before graduation and they were having a goodbye lunch or dinner or whatever. And one of, they were talking about what they'd miss in New York because they were all scattering to other places. And one of them said, oh, I, I found a place, and she turned to my friend, who was the only Jew at the table, and said, you're gonna like this, it's about saving money. She said she had found a great store. You could, you, or this audience will know exactly what I'm describing. She said, it's in the Bronx, you've got a schlep there, but they sell clothing with the original tags on it, and it's from Lord and & Taylor, and what am I t describing? Oh. Lomans of blessed memory. You know, Aleha Shalom, right? Um, you had more fun in those changing rooms if you, if you didn't go fist the cuffs with someone, you know, that was mine, mine, mine. Um, but she turned to my friend and said, you know, you're going to like this story because it's about saving money. And my friend said, I didn't know Jews were the only ones smart enough to want to save their hard earned money. And the person got it. But most of us would have thought of that answer at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but, but take it seriously. You do take it seriously. You're here tonight in the rain, so you obviously take it seriously. But educate yourself. Educate others. Doesn't mean when someone says something, you're going to knock them in the you know, face and, and punch them out. But say, do you realize that that's anti-Semitic? Do you realize that Jews aren't all white? Or even if we are white, we aren't all rich. Or we aren't, you know, and, and, and to explain, because many people, see, anti-Semitism is the oldest, most continuous hatred. There is no other prejudice which has existed this long and this continuously, none. You can go back to Alexandria. You can go back to the first century Judea, you know, when, when Christianity was arising. You can go to Rome. You can go to uh, the birth of Islam. You can go to the birth of Protestantism, socialism. You know, it's, it's, it's been there. So what does that mean? It means for many people, it's a perceived truth. It's so old and it's so deep in the world's DNA, if you will, that people accept it as a perceived truth. And the point, and to disabuse people of that is hard. But we've got to do it. And thank God there are resources, there are books, there are good articles that have come out that, that are worth looking at and, and trying to educate people about. That's one thing. Uh, I think the other thing is, and it's easy to say, um, but uh, I wear a Magain David. I didn't grow up in a family where we wore Magain Davids. Not that we didn't. I think if I'd asked my parents for one, they would have happily given me one. But I wear a Magain David. And sometimes, you know, like when I'm at the airport, which I am a lot, and I want to push the head of the line or something, I remember I'm wearing a Magain David. Now, that's sort of internalized anti-anti-Semitism. But, but I would urge you not to go underground as Jews. Um, By the way, I want to say I've never seen so many Magen David necklaces uh, yes, that people yes, are wearing now. Yes, 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 yes. Um, you know, for a threat, I talked earlier about threat to democracy and threat to stability. For an active measure, an active measure is code word for people who study disinformation, which, by the way, was a Soviet disinformatia. It was a Soviet creation. Plant, not misinformation, which can be a mistake. Disinformation, purposeful lies. And so when, the, when governments or individuals act in active measures, they don't have to be successful to work to be a success. They don't have to do anything to be a success. Case in point, about two weeks after the war began, Hamas declared that one Friday would be a day of rage. And I was in France shortly after that, and I was meeting with the CRIF, the, the leaders of the organized Jewish community, and they told me that though they had urged parents to send their kids to school on that day of rage, there were gendarmes in front of every school, they had private security guards, 
some 80% of the parents chose not to. I'm not judging those parents at all. It's very easy for me to sit here before hundreds of you and make a speech, but if it was my kids I was sending to school, I don't know what I would do. But, and, and then I was in England and I was told certain schools closed on that day. Nothing happened, but from the perspective of Hamas, the day was a raging success because it dislocated us, it made us feel less secure. And, you know, uh, in January, I don't know if Central was one of the synagogues, but I think about 200 synagogues in the United States got calls threatening that there were bomb threats and there were threats. And it, the FBI has now uh, uh, publicized the fact um, that all those calls came from outside the United States. Now, some synagogues evacuated, some synagogues closed their preschools on that day, some went ahead with them. But, but that's the dislocation. And um, I'm not saying if there's a threat, sh but, but as much as, po don't let the fear mongers win, you know. I've been, um deeply heartened that our services have been filled to the balconies, you know, I in, know, in the I last months. Online. Oh, thank you. I'm glad. And I know that we're not the only ones. I know that synagogues all around are just seeing an uptick and people are, you know, overcoming their fear. Because I think the fear is, in some ways, it's real. And there's their achim gam gam yachad. Yes. So it's been powerful. Um, you reminded me when you talked about this oldest hatred, which morphs and everything else, of a question that is maybe the haunting question that I have heard from a 10-year-old child that I didn't know exactly how to answer, and so I'm going to ask you to give me a better answer than the one I'm sure I gave, where she just said, after hearing about what happened and seeing a protest that was happening up in her neighborhood, and she just said, why do they hate us so much? And you know, it's a, it's a haunting question for a child to have to like a Jewish child in America to have to actually still ask that question. Do you have any answer for that? I don't have an easy answer. If I had the easy answer, my job wouldn't exist because we would have figured it out. But I think what we have to give that 10-year-old, and I think if she was asking you that question, she's probably getting it, a strong sense of her own identity a strong sense of who she is, not in opposition to anti-Semitism, but in positive. You know, you've often heard me use the line that if we're gonna draw a spectrum of Jewish life, at one end, one pole at the end is oi, and the other end is joy. And we've gotta give the kid the joy so that being Jewish is not something that you do defensively, but, and being Jewish is not just learning about how Jews died, which is what I teach about, um, or the threats of anti-Semitism, which is also what I teach about. But because I'm often asked, how do I do this? How do I do this day after day? I've even had this conversation with the Secretary of State. And it's that I know who I am, and I know what I come from, and I revel in it. I'm happy to be a Jew. I feel like I've gotten, I won the prize. Um, and, but you have to know something. I mean, you can feel it in your guts, but, but it's also, you have to learn, study, which you have so many opportunities here in Central to plug for your uh, education program, which doesn't need any plugs. Um, but, but, to, to be proud of, of who you are and to think of how much we've given to the world and how much uh, we have done for the world. And when you think, even just think of Israel, it's, such, it's, a, it's a speck, it's hard to find on a map. And how much has come out of there? I, I love the, the things you sometimes pe see posted on X, or as the New York Times says, X, comma, formerly known as Twitter, comma. Um, you know, where people say, well, you don't want, you want to boycott Israel? Stop using, you know, ways this, and ways and, and, you know, and, and Intel every, chips and, and <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, and stents and so many other things. Um, Cherry tomatoes. Right, right. That's, that's <laughs> important. Um, 
but it's not just what, but the, the genius of Judaism, the beauty of Judaism, what it has stood for. Um, we have to be as much propelled by the pulls as we are enraged by the pushes. Amen to that. I, I would like, even though this is the business you're in, I would like for the Jewish community to invest at least as much in Jewish camps and Jewish education and um, joyful Jewish living than in fighting anti-Semitism because I do ultimately think we're, I, I, we can't pretend even with the, with the, with the most heroic fighter of anti-Semitism in the most important position right now as you are, you're still not gonna end anti-Semitism. It's, 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 it's been persisting for all these times. So what we have to do is actually create confident, proud Jews. And that's, um, that, is, that is the business that we have to be you in. You know, it, it, some, I'm often asked, how do I do this job? Because, you know, I get to worry about, to work on this 24-6, and to be honest, sometimes 24-7. Um, and first of all, I'm lucky. We're all worried about it. I get to try to do something about it. So, so that's, that's important. But there's, a, there's another important aspect, and maybe I know we're, we're running short on time, so I'll just tell the story briefly. I was at, there's a famous, um, book festival in Wales, Hay on Why or Why on Hay. Book lovers here will know which one I'm talking about. And I was there, I was talking about 400 people. It was when my book on anti-Semitism has come out. And I was being interviewed by the former editor of a major uh, British daily. And she asked me at the end, she said, how do, you, how do you do this? How do you study this? How do you talk about this? Why aren't you depressed? And I said to her that you know, I had been in Bath that morning, and you go down to the reconstructed baths, you know, the hot springs there, and uh, the Romans thought the baths were a gift of God, so they had created, first of all, they created, a, a, the, the, in the day, I'm sure it was a first-class spa, hot baths, cold baths, massage rooms, and I said, oh, I could get have gotten into this. This would have been nice to go to. And then you got to the room where there was a, the temple of the gods. For them, because hot springs were a gift of the gods. And I said, I guess if I had wanted to go here, I would have had to join their team as opposed to my team. In other words, there's no logical reason why we should still be here as Jews for persecute, just the attraction of, of being in the majority. We were, we were in the minority and it wasn't, it wasn't always beautiful and it wasn't always easy. And then came uh, persecution of, of early Christianity and then came crusades and then came Chalnitsky pogroms in the 17th century, uh, 16th century, and then came uh, pogroms in the late 19th, early 20th century. And then of course came the Shoah. How is it possible that we're still here? It makes no sense, and I say that as a historian, it makes absolutely no sense. If that doesn't give you confidence, <laughs> then I don't know what can. Amen. So, so in, in, or just one last question, what gives you hope? All right, we, okay. I said, can we end with what one last thing that gives you hope or a song? And Deborah said, a song. <laughs> Well, if I'm in Angela's presence, I want to hear her singing. Okay, well, I think we're going to sing together. So, um, Deborah, will you stand up with me, though? But I think, can we all rise together? And you actually said how good it is, how good it is for us to gather together. Hine matovu manayim. So let's just end with that because um, I think that it is a tremendous privilege that we get to gather as Jews um, in, in one large community. And and be strong and continue to live this tradition in a way that, um, you know, it's a miracle that we're still here. With 
with gratitude to our amazing Jewish heroine and ambassador for the work she is doing on behalf of the Jewish people and democracy and America. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Good night.